<laughs> okay. <clears throat> uh, welcome back, everyone. We're going to be starting uh, in a minute or so as people are trickling back in from the coffee break. So um, Vince kindly agreed to swap slots with Valerio, so, but otherwise the program will proceed as announced. And uh, he's going to be talking about the game theory. About game theory. Game right, theory yeah. project, that, <laughs> like similar to Nicoletta's uh, project. Yes, yeah, Nicoletta's my, my student. Yes. We work together. Right. <laughs> so um, welcome, Vince, and thanks for like, uh, helping out the organizers on no, this one. No, no problem. Um, thanks, for, thanks for having me. I, I, know, I know how hard organizing these things can be and how much work it is. So uh, thank you for, for putting on this great event. Uh, my name's Vince. Um, I've already tweeted out links to this talk as well as um, links to the preprint that I'm actually going to be talking about. So this talk is going to be kind of following this, this archive preprint here and explaining some of the ideas and how we've used Python to, to do that. Um, I'm a mathematician at Cardiff University in Wales, in the UK, still in Europe. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm also a uh, Software Sustainable Institute fellow. That's been mentioned uh, a little bit. So best practice in terms of uh, software uh, as used in research is important to me. And finally, I'm a, I'm a game theorist. I'm one of the core developers for the Axelrod library, which is Nicoletta's poster uh, is about it. And that's what this, this logo is about. And the work I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, not just mine. There's five authors on, on the paper, um, four authors on the paper, pardon me, um, and also a, a huge number of contributors to the actual Axelrod library itself. And so that's why the, the title of this talk, um, if you've got the program in front of you, has the word citizen science in it, uh, because I, I really feel it's a, it's a nice scientific effort. So this is a tweet. Um, I don't know how well you can see it at, at the back. This is a tweet I saw a, a little while ago by a um, postdoc from Penn State called Kirsty McCloyd. And she tweets, sets up flawless heat competition trial. Lizards will fight over a hot po podium. There can only be one winner. So the, the idea is, I understand, by my uh, naive understanding, is there's this pen, there's two lizards in the pen, and there's one podium that's warm um, in the pen. And lizards are cold-blooded, so they like the warm podium. And so she's going to be able to look at how they fight uh, over this podium. All right? Um, perhaps, and here I'm extrapolating from a tweet, perhaps to study over a longitudinal time if it's always the same lizard that wins the podium, perhaps. OK? Um, so that's interesting. Certainly nothing I know anything about. And this is the picture that came up. Again, I don't know how well you can see it at the back, but what the picture is showing is the two lizards lying on top of each other on top of the podium. So everything was put in place for these two lizards to fight. I was going to say to the death, but I don't think that's true. To fight for the podium. And, um, and the two lizards just said, hey, let's just chill. Let's just, let's just cooperate, right? Let's just work together. We can both enjoy the podium. And let's just all get along. Um, so they didn't defect. And I'm going to use the word defect and cooperate in this talk. Defect meaning not cooperate. So in this instance, fight, scratch, whatever it is lizards do. Uh, instead, they cooperated. They just said, let's just work it out. And this tweet kind of encompasses everything that game theory tries to do. Apologies to the cameraman. I realize I walk around, so just give up. Um, <laughs> uh, um, but thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, this tweet is really nice because it kind of encompasses everything about game theory in that a lot of modeling we do is we set out rules from above and we let that dictate the environment. So we define the rules and we measure the environment. But game theory does the opposite. It creates the environment, and then it finds out what the behavior is from it. Okay. So in this particular instance, uh, Kirsty created the environment, had an expectation of what the behavior would be. Right? The lizards would fight, and it was wrong. Okay. Uh, the lizards cooperated, and so this is a really nice kind of example of game theory. Where you can 
trying to understand what, what behavior is going to be given an environment. And in particular, a lot of what game theory is interested in is why are we nice to each other, right? Why do we cooperate, okay? Um, why do people work really, really hard to put on these types of conferences, right? Why do people do that? Um, one tool game theory has to study this is called a Moran process. So a Moran process is a very simple birth-death process that puts behavior in an evolutionary setting. Um, and the keynote yesterday, Julia actually spoke about a really cool paper where essentially they were putting scientific behavior in this kind of setting. I haven't read that paper just yet, but I'm really looking forward to it. And so the idea is we have a population, and so perhaps blue are the lizards that are cooperative and red are the lizards that are uh, not cooperative. And we select one of the lizards, so one of the behaviors, and that selection can be based on fitness of how well they do in their environment. We reproduce that, so we have this birth step, so we have another one, and then we, we choose another individual, completely at random, not necessarily dependent on their fitness, and that individual is removed, okay? So the Moran process is a model of an evolutionary process in which the population numbers stay the same, okay? There's no, no, no one enters, no one leaves. Um, you, can, you can write a Moran process, basically evolution, in 30 lines of Python, if you include a doc string. Uh, I don't expect you to read that. I'm going to, I'm going to zoom in on the lines 14 to 26. And this is just me, me repeating what I just said. So the idea is we go through every player in our population, and we start building up a score. And that score comes out of playing a game. Every player plays against every other player in the population. And we add up that, that score. The game is. I'll talk about it in a little bit, just a NumPy array, okay? And then this is the selection part where our fitness just informs an overall probability distribution based on how good we were, right? So that does allow weak people to continue and to have birth, but also allows, uh, but is more favorable towards strong in terms of fitness. And then finally, we simply get rid of a random individual. This is the game we're going to talk about. So I, I've mentioned that we're talking about cooperation, and one of the famous games for the study of cooperation is The Prisoner's Dilemma. So that's a two-player game. Um, some of you might already be aware about The Prisoner's Dilemma from, you know, your own knowledge, but a couple of months ago something went uh, viral. Nikki Case put a wonderful web game together that went around where you could look at cooperation and stuff. That's basically what I'm talking about, and that's a wonderful, wonderful tool. Um, I recommend playing around with it. Um, so this is the game, and we have two players, a row player, let's call them lizards, a row lizard and a column lizard, and the row lizard decides which column, which row we're in, and the column lizard decides which column we're in. And the first matrix is the utilities to the row lizard, and the second matrix is the utilities to the column lizard. They have two strategies, to cooperate or defect, so to just lie there at the top of the podium, or to be ready to fight, okay? We'll call lying there at the top of the podium their first strategy, so cooperation is their first strategy. If they both cooperate, they both get a score of three, which is pretty good, all right? But if I see you lying there at the top of the podium, basically ready to share this podium with me, and I just come in and start fighting you, you're not ready for the fight, so I'll immediately get a utility of five, because I'll have the whole podium myself, I'll feel real good about pushing you off the podium, and you'll get a utility of zero, because you'll be sad, all right? So if you put us in the first row, I should defect, I should put us in the second column. And that also holds, if you're standing atop at the podium in a very aggressive way, ready for a fight, then that means that if I just walk up, you're going to throw me off, so I'm going to come prepared for a fight. We'll both get very damaged, maybe not even make it to the top of the podium. Who knows, right? And so when we just look at the prisoner's dilemma by itself, we have what's called a Nash equilibria, which is that we both end up in this bottom left, bottom right corner of just defecting, okay? So then we come back to the question of why are we nice to each other, right? Um, because game theory says we shouldn't, because something like this is more or less valid of any interaction. 
Um, Robert Axelrod is a, a game theorist who in the 1980s really started a, a, a bunch of research about the prisoner's dilemma. He invited individuals to submit strategies for the prisoner's dilemma, but the strategies being what happens if we play it multiple times. So we don't just play it once, because if we just play it once, we should defect. There is nothing subtle about that. However, if we start playing it multiple times and our reputation becomes important, and it's all about how do we invest in our own reputation, that becomes interesting. So Robert Axelrod created some, uh, invited uh, academics in the 1980s to submit computer code that would play this game against each other and, and would uh, see what happens. And this leads me to a Python library called the Axelrod Python library. It's almost three years old, and it allows you to do this type of research. So for example, we can create tit for tat as a strategy, and we can play cooperator, and we can get them to play against each other for five turns. And we see cooperator versus tit for tat, they both cooperated for the five turns. So they just got along from the start, all right? Two lizards from the start jumped on top of the podium and got along. Um, tit for tat versus defector, defector just blindly looks for a fight, takes advantage of a cooperation. So what happens is we start, cooperator starts out by cooperating, sorry, tit for tat starts by cooperating, defector defects, and then tit for tat realizes what's happening and starts defecting against defector. And then finally we've got tit for tat versus alternator, alternator starts by cooperating and then just alternates. Um, it's a good name. Um, and what we see here is we can kind of see what tit for tat is doing. Tit for tat is in fact just doing whatever alternator did in the previous turn, okay? And Axelrod's tournaments um, kind of spurned a whole bunch of research because of the fact that, alt that Tit for Tat won both these tournaments uh, and won these tournaments against much more complicated strategies. Uh, people were like, well, that's kind of an inclination to begin to understanding why we cooperate with each other because Tit for Tat is fundamentally a strategy that will cooperate, okay? Um, we can look at that in an evolutionary setting. So putting those strategies in a Moran process. And so what we're seeing here is a Moran process that's created with the Axelrod library, which has lots of plotting capabilities built in. And we see if we start off with a population of defectors and we throw one cooperator in there, over time, the cooperator gets pushed back out. So the defectors have resisted the invasion of the cooperator. But the opposite is also possible. We can throw one cooperator in, and after time, the whole population could could change. So that's kind of what we're interested in is why over time do we evolve this cooperative behavior? But these strategies are very simple. Cooperate and defect are not subtle. They're in fact rather dumb, right? They, they just always do the same thing. They don't gain any information from who they're playing. They don't build up an understanding of what's going on. So this work that I'm talking to you about today made use of a structure of a strategy. This is called a finite state machine which is a well-studied mathematical object, but in, in a prisoner's dilemma setting, basically we have the history of both plays, and we have these states that change over time, and they represent how we feel. Cool. We can train these with what's called a dojo, so actually we train these strategies using a genetic algorithm, and they look like this. So all the genetic algorithm is doing is basically moving arrows around, changing actions, and building up um, a strategy. And so what we're doing is we're using a genetic algorithm to, to train strategies to perform in a genetic process. We put all these strategies that we had, some of them trained, some of them pre-programmed, in a big tournament, but this tournament wasn't just a match, it was an evolutionary process. And here are some of the results. So we have the top invaders, we have some strategies that are able to invade 20% of the time, and we have the top resistors. And I want to talk about the top resistors. TF1, TF2, and TF3 that you see in bold there are these trained finite state machines. And they are, in fact, basically uninvadable, right? What's really cool about them, looking at this plot, this shows that what these TF1 strategy does over multiple turns and against multiple strategies. So every row is another strategy, and then these are uh, all these turns. And what we're seeing is TF1 always starts with two cooperations and a defection. We didn't tell it to do that. The algorithm trained it to do that. And what that means 
is that TF1 and TF, T, sorry, is that TF1 in fact has a secret handshake, um, where if we follow this line against the player that's playing the same finite state machine, they'll both cooperate twice, then defect, and then as long as they have that final defection, they'll end up in this state here, where they'll just be in a loop of cooperations. So that's why they're so good at resisting invasion, because they basically have a secret handshake. They walk around, go like, oh, you're me. Cool, let's just get along. And they do that very, very quickly. And so that is a really neat finding because it came out of the algorithm to go back to those lizards. It, we didn't say it, we got it out of it. And so it kind of points towards why and how evolutionary processes can evolve self-recognition mechanisms. The reason this was possible is because we had a huge diversity of strategies with which we could train. At the time of writing the paper, we had 164 strategies. We, in, in fact, have more than 211 now. And that's all possible because writing a strategy for the library is a simple PR on GitHub. And we've had contributors from all walks of life. This is my last slide, kind of. There's lots of information if you want a photo, if any of this is interesting. This is the slide to take a photo of. Um, Nicoletta, you've already seen, is one of the collaborators on this. And Owen and Mark are the other two core developers of the library. Um, the actual information for the library is there. If you're interested in game theory, my course is there, and that's actually built up on a bunch of Jupyter notebooks where I teach game theory to our first years. But the final thing I'll finish on is Julie is one of these collaborators who, as part of a course, had to, had to um, contribute to an open source project. And we've had contributors from game theorists, computer scientists, but actually a lot of students that just come and submit the strategy. Uh, Julie, in fact, did way more than submit a strategy. She made fundamental uh, bill changes to the, to the library itself that greatly improved it. But that, that's been a really great uh, contribution where when I say citizen science, we don't just have people lending us some cores on a computer they're not using. People are actually writing strategies that we're using. So that, that's, that's fantastic. Final thing that I finish on, I'm an organizer of PyCon UK. If you're interested in PyCon UK, come see me. But accommodation's already super expensive, so uh, good luck. Um, <laughs> and yeah, that's all I have to say.